Howdy, everybody. Welcome back. Hello. How's it going, Corsia? Chilling. Uh, <clears throat> nothing too crazy is happening. We had a, our Dynasty rookie draft, the two of us, a couple of days ago. So Dynasty football has been on my mind recently. But, uh, yep, that's me. Yeah, I managed to get Brock Bowers, Michael Penix, and then Jermaine Burden all in the <clears> same <throat> draft. So I'm really excited about my picks. Uh -huh. Corsia, do you want to tell the – Tell the audience uh, who you had. Yeah. Spoil yeah, it out. I, a a good draft. I got Jaden Daniels, uh, Drake May, and then Kamani Vidal. A couple solid guys. Yeah. I, I have myself to blame. You should have waited on the ASC South a little bit. Uh, <laughs> that was a guy I was hoping to get in the third round, but I'm I'm happy with Burden and Vidal. I totally knew once Corey time picked him, like, oh, I shouldn't have mentioned him on the podcast. But no, um, Corey Chan, Corey Chan did some maneuvering around, got – Couple first round picks, so mm -hmm. he's very quarterback heavy in this roster. If you notice, he has like six guys that he's trying out um, <clears throat> to see like who who's gonna who's gonna stick next to the year. Yeah. So it's a very interesting strat. Yeah, somebody's um, got to somebody's bound to pan, uh, pan out. So hey, man, uh, if you just take all quarterbacks in your draft, somebody's got to do well. You know. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah. Alrighty. Okay, so last division in our summer series breakdown. Um, going division by division, team breakdown. I know, shocker, right? We actually Crazy. did it. It felt faster than last year for some mm. reason, and maybe it's because I wasn't working at that point last year. But it's it's just it's just why we're almost done. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to be talking about Super Bowl runner up, San Francisco 49ers. A lot of intriguing teams, new faces. Um, like I'm really excited about this. Like for some divisions, we had talked about it being the most competitive. This year, like, I think we can chalk that up for, like, AFC North every single year. AFC South in particular. I have a sneaky feeling NFC West will be this way. So, um, we'll start with the 49ers. They finished um, first in the conference, I believe, and first in their division at a 12-5 and record. Um, bound for Super Bowl. Uh, I was just telling course down off air. Today, somebody, I walked up to somebody. They were like, Brock Purdy is not a top-10 quarterback. Mm -hmm. Um because I briefly just mentioned, oh, Brock Purdy, top 10 quarterback, pretty good. I, I don't forget the context that I was bought in. And I was like, okay, if you don't think he's a top 10 quarterback, name 10 players above him. And then one of them mentioned Jared Goff. And all due respect to Jared Goff, but I would put Purdy <coughs> above him with what, what Purdy has done um, in his first two seasons. For, for Goff, I think it took him a while to get there. And – like you, why does have an argument that they're ranked similarly? I would pick Perry personally above him. Um, but yeah, with the San Francisco 49ers, Corsian, when you take a look at their schedule, how good, how good of a chance do you think they have to run it back? Oh, I think they have a pretty decent chance at that. Like, I'm scrolling through their schedule right now, <clears throat> and like, sure, I think their division will be competitive, they may lose a couple. Oh, uh, within the division, but outside of that, like they open up with the Jets, which I think is pretty winnable, just with like Aaron Rodgers not having played football in so long. Um, you know, Aaron Rodgers could get hot this year and you know be a contender, but I think it'll be kind of a late season playoff push for the Jets. And so look at that. Um <clears throat> I feel like outside of their division, the Chiefs in week seven is their first like tough game that they have. And so you got, you know, like week seven, eight against the Cowboys could be tough. Uh, the Packers might be a tough team. Bills or Dolphins, Lions. So that's like six teams that I think they could potentially lose to. Don't realistically see them losing all six of those. Um, so I think like a 12-win floor to maybe like a 14-win ceiling is kind of how I envision the 49ers this year. Wow. Wow. That's high. That's high praise. Uh, mm -hmm. That's basically saying they have they have the best shot of, out of any team in the conference to go back to Super Bowl. <clears throat> mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, I probably wouldn't go that high with them personally, just because I think, like you mentioned with the NFC West, I think the competition will be sneaky good this year. Like, mm -hmm. I don't think Arizona is going to be as bad as they were last season. Mm -hmm. um, they have more talent on their team. And then um, – Coaching staff changes with Seattle, I think, is going to be an improvement. And Los Angeles might be a team that people are counting out a lot this year. And granted, losing Aaron Donald is a huge loss. But 
I think their floor has to be 11 wins, in my opinion, mm-hmm. 10 or 11 wins. I'm like, that's a debate there. I think unless Brock Purdy or like Brandon Ayuk and like Debo, like if like three of their five like main superstar weapons are out, this team, you could chalk it up to at least a 10 win season. <clears throat> um, I think their ceiling is about 13 wins. So I'm right around there. But I think once you start getting to the oh, 14 win category, then it's like, whoa. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a that's a really, really good season for them. They're basically everybody is hunting them in the playoffs type of team. So um like although we're right around there for the records, um it's I think it's a pretty good indicator that this team the team has the personnel at least to mm-hmm. make it back. And and we'll see what happens. They did have, they did have some coaching changes we'll we'll discuss. But before mm-hmm. that, um what did you think of their free agency? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I think what was interesting is on offense, it pretty much looks like they're running it back, um, which kind of just shows the confidence they have. I know Brandon Ayuk, he's been showing up at the uh, in offseason training camp, which is a good sign for at least this season. Um, and I think the Ford Niners very much need him this year, so I'm, I'm glad that things will likely stick out, I think, this year, at least for, you know, keeping the team together. But um, defense is where I think they had a lot of cool additions. Um, two being two players that I like being uh, Malik Collins at the defensive tackle position. They traded for him from the Texans, and then they signed Devondre Campbell from the Packers. Um, <clears throat> and I think that's good, especially with Drake Greenlaw just coming off of a big injury. He, there's a good chance he's not even, you know, playing the first couple weeks of the year. Maybe even halfway into the season, he's not really getting too much play time. I wouldn't um, expect prime Dre Greenlaw until like November or like, mm-hmm. or I shouldn't say prime, maybe 80% of him mm-hmm. until November. <clears throat> and so, yeah, just having Devondre Campbell there is a nice fill in. And then once Greenlaw's back and ready to go, likely for the playoffs, um, it'll be pretty dangerous having three solid linebackers uh, just kind of managing the game off ball. Yeah. And um, I think the big. Like they would hope they had hoped like Chase Young would have stayed there for the long haul. But I think with the way they constructed their offensive pieces and the trade for Christian McCaffrey made it very, very difficult to keep mm-hmm. Chase Young um, for beyond that one year <laughs> until they had him. Um, so I think the free agency signing of Leonard Ford was a really good one that mm-hmm. they needed to have on the opposite side of Nick Bosa. You definitely didn't want to lose that. And then I think with Gross Matos as like more depth, San Francisco needs that. They have to have depth on the defensive line. That's what's made their defense what it was. So I think to me, that's another significant signing when I'm thinking about that. And then as well as like Malik Collins getting getting over to San Francisco. Mm-hmm. So um yeah, I'm I'm in large agreement with you. I think this year rise on like the health of their offense. And I know they've had pieces just out throughout the year, and Brock Purdy wasn't himself until like December, I believe coming off that UCL injury, which is pretty remarkable, to be honest, to see how he played through all of that mm-hmm. um, in the first half of the season. Normally, in those situations, like, there's a lot of drama. Think about, like, at the start of, like, this uh, last season. Nobody knew who the starting quarterback was going to be. Mm-hmm. Like, there were arguments about, like, oh, is it going to be Trey Lance or Brock Purdy or, like, Sam Darnold? And, like, to have a resounding answer like that with a guy coming off a UCL injury and still dealing with it, the treatments and whatnot, the first half it's pretty impressive i don't think people give back credit enough credit um but from the free agency standpoint i think they did a good job to like add to the depth of their team given that their offense and defense is so top heavy from like a mm-hmm. top 22 perspective so that is one thing to point out there mm-hmm. <clears throat> yeah and it's just nice that the fact that their top 22 is so good that um you know you are able to work through injuries and you don't necessarily need your backups to be playing on an unbelievably elite level. Um, like, especially looking at the uh, defensive line, right? Like when you have Nick Bosa, and like Javon Hargrave down there, um, offenses have to put like, re- you know, allocate resources towards stopping them, which obviously makes it easier for guys like Malik Collins and Leonard Floyd, who both I do think are still pretty good players, but let the, lets them, uh, ball out a little bit more kind of like with how Floyd balled out with the Rams when Aaron Donald and Von Miller were there for a little bit. 
Yeah, all you need those guys to do is beat their one-on-ones. Because mm-hmm. from like an offensive line perspective, unless you're committing seven in protection every time, you have to double one guy and then trust that the rest of your line could block one-on-one, right? Mm-hmm. So that that's kind of like the strategy there. And to have guys that can win one-on-one opposite of Bosa is really, really important. Because now you can't play Bosa the same way all the time. Sometimes, like depending on matchup, like you have to help out like other guys on the line due to injury death, due to strategic changes. Like um, Lee Collins is dominating snap to snap. You don't want that to just happen all the time, right? Mm-hmm. So you have to do things like that. And I think it gives the 49ers flexibility in their rest packages for sure. Um, going to their draft, there are two guys that really stuck out to me that I think um, they need it from the depth perspective. Obviously, the first round pick with the Brandon IU news but i think just from a scouting perspective i really really liked ricky pearsall coming out of the draft i think this is a good landing spot for him he gives he gives a lot of like what the 49ers didn't have with like a jump ball winning receiver but he's also a great route uh, route runner Mm -hmm. so he's not under pressure to like even overtake juan jennings right away which Mm -hmm. i think it's really nice and if you consider like Kyle Shanahan's track record for developing receivers. It's been really, really good. Think about Brandon Ayuk when he first started. He was in the pretty much in the doghouse his like first two seasons. Like I remember like he was touted as like the next breakout receiver. And rightfully so, but like um the season where he was pegged to break out, he just didn't for whatever reason. Like Shanahan hated him. And Brandon Ayuk worked on his mental game. He worked on the other parts of being receivers, run blocking. And now he's like one of the best receivers in the league looking to be paid like a top five option. Mm-hmm. And you think about Julio Jones, <laughs> you think about Pierre Garçon, like guys that have developed in Shanahan's, not that Julio developed, but like guys that have succeeded in Shanahan's system. Like he's worked with different types of guys, especially probably Julio Jones in particular. Like that's somebody like that Ricky Pierce also should watch, like Atlanta Falcons, Julio Jones in the Shanahan scheme. That's, that's somebody you can take parts of a game from learn and see, Oh, how does this fit in the system? Mm-hmm. And to have like two, two receivers ahead of him, like great offensive talent elsewhere. Like he landed in a great spot in my opinion. So mm-hmm. I love that selection. And then the other guys, Isaac Arendo for a lot of the same reasons I mentioned for Ike Pearsall. Um, this is the classic, like late round selection by Shanahan. But like you, you think about some of the guys that he's drafted in the late round, um, Shoot, I'm remember. I can't. Like, it's one of it's one of those like seventh round picks that he drafted, that I just can't think of right now. Even though it was like two years ago, before they got McCaffrey. Um, he was like he's like the handcuff to McCaffrey last year, but he started the year before. Man, I gotta look at their depth chart. Elijah Mitchell. Elijah Mitchell. Yeah, everybody was raving <clears throat> about Elijah Mitchell in the in the seventh round, right? And I, of course, was like a Trey Sermon truther at the times. So I was like, Trey Sermon's a better player. Um, but, like, this is one of those selections to me where it's like, but uh, Garendo is a technically sound player coming out of the draft. I think he's better than, than Elijah Mitchell in some respects. Um, but this is another <laughs> example of a late-round investment on a guy who's going to add value to the team. Mm-hmm. And I'm not saying Isaac Garendo is going to add, like, 600 mm-hmm. rushing yards in his rookie season. I'm saying where he's going to help them out is like getting definitive touchdowns, getting the third and ones, third and, the third and twos. That's the type of play you're getting out of him. So I really like those two selections out of the draft. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> yeah, I'm in kind of a similar boat. Um, I was a big fan of the uh, Isaac Garendo pick. Uh, yeah, I liked his running style and like there's like potential chance that they eventually move on from Elijah Mitchell. Um, and obviously Christian McCaffrey, he's nearing 30. So, I mean, you, you look at, you look towards your options, uh, on this current depth shot, that, depth chart that we got from ESPN, it has him listed above Jordan Mason, which I think is good. Last season, Jordan Mason is getting a lot of hype. And so, um, just the fact that he's already listed above and seems like, like public perception of him is already pretty high. So I think that's a good thing. Um, I hope Ricky Pearsall plays good. I know right now. He's currently out uh, with a hamstring injury, and that always scares me with receivers because I feel like that's such a lingering injury that I see with wide receivers. And so hopefully, uh, for his sake, you know, I hope it's not one of those lingering hamstring issues. 
um, that keeps him out of the game, especially because, like you said, he's really talented. Um, but um, that is a, that is like a one like small concern that I do have with him. But um, luckily, you know, he has time. He, he there's, he's in a situation where he, he does get hurt um, consistently, at least. Uh, he doesn't necessarily need to be forced back into the starting lineup to, you know, help the 49ers keep up with the other top teams in the NFC when you've got guys like Debo, Ayuk, Kittle, Juszczyk, even McCaffrey, you know, all these guys that will dominate regardless of Pearsall playing or not right now. Yeah. Yeah, 100, 100% agree. I don't think it's like, I don't think the sky's falling for sure if, like, if, the, um, if Pearsall's out. He's like kind of like a nice to have. Um, they do have reliable guys ahead of them. So I'm not I'm not too worried. I'm just talking about the long term future, and mm-hmm. plus you need to see what you have in Ronnie Bell. Like it's getting harder and harder for him to stand out on the roster with the news like these. But like um, he might he, he showed some flashes last season, so we'll see. Um, the one the one thing that had happened over the past season is they got rid of Steve Wilkes um, as defensive coordinator after that Super Bowl. I thought it was kind of like a reactionary move, but they went ahead and promoted Nick Sorensen as defensive coordinator. Um, he spent three years with the 49ers in total. He served as a defensive passing game coordinator past two seasons. So, um, like, San Francisco has been really good at limiting rush yards and total yards per game. We'll see what happens with this new coordinator. <clears throat> I, I think this move kind of indicates expect more of the same. But until you call a game, like, from start to finish, like, throughout the, I want to see what happens to their defense the first seven games because are we going to see improvement within those first seven games? Are they going to be consistently great no matter who's, like, calling play calls for them? I want to see what happens. Um, that's probably the only thing I'm worried about from a 49ers perspective. Mm-hmm. I got all the confidence in the world they can make a deep playoff run next season. <clears throat> Yeah, and I think one thing that benefits the 49ers in regards to, like, just the coaching staff is the fact that this team is so loaded. Um, just coordinators in general for this team can kind of try out more unique strategies and kind of, like, figure things out a little bit at a slower pace if needed just because it's, like, the talent's so loaded, you know. So I think even with technically subpar, you know, defensive play calling, the fact that you got guys like, Bosa, Warner, Hufanga, guys on all three levels of this defense that are able to just dominate the game pretty much regardless, I think is nice. And I think we've seen pretty good transitions so far from defensive coordinators, at least for the 49ers past couple seasons too. So, um, I'm not- Yeah, I mean, Jamaica Ryan's like moving on to become a head coach. That's pretty, that's pretty good. Mm-hmm. It's a good sign that you're doing some good things. Mm-hmm. And it's also a good place for like coaching revivals as well because mm-hmm. – just scrolling down the list, I just look, and Brandon Staley is one of the assistant head coaches and mm-hmm. they're also helping out with the defense. So mm-hmm. maybe another career revival for him. Um, I know he was rightfully touted as a great defensive mind from Los Angeles and his time with the Chicago Bears, but the head coaching stuff didn't really work out for him like in Los Angeles. So we'll see, like on the Chargers, so we'll see how he does like an assistant role under Kyle. I think that would be very important to see. Does he glean some things that maybe he misread? Um, like where whether it was being too trigger happy on fourth downs and stuff like that. So um, that's another intriguing thing I didn't expect to see while parsing through this coaching staff. But um, it is a good thing that you see coaches move on elsewhere, like Robert Sala, D'Amico Ryan's, and then um, Steve Wilkes got another shot. I think it's a very the, uh, like you mentioned, the talent on this team makes it so like you can be really flexible and do coaching mm-hmm. calls. So um, that pressure really interesting. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Um, finishing second in the division, Los Angeles Rams. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Think we're oh, forgetting. yeah. I I <clears throat> dropped all on this. I totally forgot. Okay. Um, second year breakout. Who you got? My second year breakout. Um, I'm gonna put. Cameron Latu. Uh, he was a guy I think a lot, or at least I was pretty high on coming out of the draft last season. Obviously, he's listed third here, but um, I mean, George Kittle's been like on and off with injury historically. He played most of the season last year. Logan Ryan's like 35 years old or something. And so 
there's opportunity for him to kind of get more playtime in the next couple seasons, and I'd like to see him at least ball out here and there. But it's kind of just a not flashier pick, but it's a guy that I was pretty excited for and hope to see. I'll get yeah, better over the next couple seasons. Yeah, hopefully you um, you hope that um, George Kittle and Logan Thomas stay healthy. Um, mm-hmm. I actually like this landing spot for Logan Thomas a lot, actually. Um, but I'm going to say Ronnie Bell. Mm-hmm. I think it doesn't look great for him that they picked up Ricky Pearsall because I think Pearsall is a better player. But I think for him, he's already had a year under the scheme. And, like, with Jennings, Jennings is, like, reliable. But, like, I think Bell has a ceiling that can allow him to get more snaps ahead of Jennings. He just has to prove he's reliable within the scheme. And if he's as reliable as Jennings and in the scheme, I think it's going to make it's going to make keeping Ayuk very difficult mm-hmm. because you have this talent pipeline con- coming at receiver recently and you're mm-hmm. trying to manage the cap for future years. Like you could probably get away with keeping Ayuk on the roster for one year. But then after that, you're screwed pretty much. Mm-hmm. So I think a second year breakout from Randy Bell would help the 49ers a ton, but I think he also has the talent to help out in certain areas of his offense. Mm-hmm. that Jennings wouldn't necessarily be able to do just because he has like a defined role within the team. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. Um, mm-hmm. Who's your X factor? Okay. I was thinking if you're going to say it. Um, <clears throat> yeah. For me, the X factor, um, honestly, is Trent Williams. Uh, you know, every game he's in or is like playing pretty good, they win pretty much. I, I'm pretty sure like the stat last year was games that he missed the 49ers lost. And so um, he's obviously a pivotal part of this offense and the success of this team. So I'm going to have uh, Trent Williams as my X factor. Yeah. Um, this, this is a difficult one for me, um, but I would probably go on the offensive line again, mm-hmm. um, just because of what really lost the game for this team. If you, if you really look at against the Chiefs, like I don't think they had any issues trying to score touchdowns. They had an issue executing touchdowns. And three plays stood out to me where Chris Jones just absolutely like demolished the interior of the 49ers and prevented like two of those touchdowns. And without that, San Francisco probably wins Super Bowl handily. Um, so I'm going to say it's John. Uh, I'm going to cheat here. It's going to be Jake Brando and John Feliciano, mm. but because they make up the interior line of San Francisco, where that might be the weakness of this overall team. And it's not that significant of a weakness because they're just so great everywhere mm-hmm. else. But that, that is the key important thing because even if Kansas city doesn't make it back to the Super Bowl, and we're assuming 49ers are making it to the Super Bowl. Whoever they're facing is probably going to have a great defensive line. Like Texans, top heavy. Cincinnati, underrated. Baltimore, they got Matabuke. That poses an entirely different problem. So, like, just just examples and like scour the rest of the AFC. You'll find somebody that is eventually going to go on these two guards. And if you can't protect that side of the ball, the interior is going to make a guy like Brock Purdy's like miserable. So. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> All righty, now we'll jump to a surprise team here. Um, obviously, losing Aaron Donald sucks to retirement, but Los Angeles has a lot to be excited about. Corsian, when you look at this team, <laughs> what they're capable of, and their roster, how does this season pan out for them? <clears throat> um, I think they got a bit of a tougher schedule than the 49ers going into this season. I think they have a few extra kind of tough teams that they got to face. Um, <clears throat> and so, but like, I, I like the talent on the team. So like, it's hard to see them do much worse than they did last year. But um, I'd say like a floor of nine wins, maybe. Um, I still think they go positive And then, a yeah, and then a ceiling of 
maybe 12 ish wins. Um, <clears throat> yeah. I just think that throughout, like, like they don't like they don't have too many easy stretches of games, is what I think gets me concerned for this team. Where I feel like the easiest part of their schedule is a three week session of the season with the Raiders, Vikings, and Seahawks, and I even agree. then, like, I feel like that's not the easiest of runs to go through, and so. Um, I still think they're a good enough team to like pull out wins against some of the tougher competition. Uh, you know, like I think they can go toe to toe with the Packers. Uh, I think, you know, the Saints, the Bills potentially are teams that they could be competitive against. And so I'm not like being super down on him, but it's, it's still going to be a tough schedule, even though I do think that uh, they win more than they lose. I think what they have going for them is the offenses to keep up with the lead teams that they get up. Mm-hmm. So that's where, like, not having Aaron Donald is really significant. Mm-hmm. But when I look at their schedule, I agree. I I think I don't – I can't see this team, like, l- losing more. Like, I can't see them winning less than eight games. So mm-hmm. I'm going to say it's, like, eight games, and I'm going to put their ceiling at 11. Like – I I don't think they're they're not as top heavy as San Francisco, especially in the defense. So that's going to be a limiting factor. But if you look at their offense and how their offense is set up, I think they can keep up with just about anybody, to be honest, Mm -hmm. where it's just going to come down to one or two possessions. And I really don't trust them against Philadelphia, Mm -hmm. San Francisco, and they might be able to get a game from San Francisco at that. Because they always play San Francisco tough. Um, mm-hmm. I wouldn't count them significantly against Detroit or Green Bay. Um, but everybody else is like, I think it's a pick em to me. Mm-hmm. I really do. I really do. Because while we know they could sweep the series against Seattle, they could sweep mm-hmm. the series against the Cardinals, even though it might be closer games <clears> than expected. <throat> like, there's, there's, there's some variance here with this team. So, like, while I give them a three, three win window, between like ceiling and floor, I think there's a lot where they have to prove themselves a little bit towards like the after week nine stretch that you mentioned, and even before mm-hmm. like, the first five games are going to be important. <clears throat> mm-hmm. Yeah, and like they have a couple like easier games splashed in there. Like I mean, the Patriots at week eleven, in between the Dolphins and the Eagles. Um, but then it's between the Dolphins and the Eagles, which makes it so tough. But then like. You know, if Stafford's back and healthy, uh, you know, playing as he does, has a great, let's say if he has a great season this year, then it's not too hard to envision them, you know, being a tough playoff competitor, but it's just a tough schedule to see. Yeah. Um, From a free agency standpoint, they took a lot of risks, in my opinion. Um, Mm -hmm. They look great on paper, like getting Tredavious White, um, getting Jimmy Garoppolo, and then. Um, getting guys like Kevin Curl, Jonah J- Jackson, Darius Williams is back. Um, Kobe Parkinson re-signing Kevin Dodson. A lot of people are like, oh, that's a big deal they gave him. But like, I don't think people have been paying attention to their young player development. They're, this is probably one of the best situations in the NFL to have developing young players in. Um, so I think they took a little bit of risk with the white pick. But I think everywhere else, you couldn't be like, oh, that was a bad move. Like, these are all, like, solid. Even the Garoppolo pick, so you mm-hmm. think about like, what their backup QB situation is like. Stafford goes down again. You don't have to rely on Stetson Bennett. And I love Stetson Bennett. But you're not having to rely on him to carry the whole team for, like, half a stretch of a season. <clears throat> mm-hmm. Like, you got a guy that started multiple multiple seasons in the NFL, plenty of experience. If – if you can make gold out of Baker Mayfield and help him revive his career, I think you could do the same thing with Jimmy Garoppolo. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, I think Jimmy Garoppolo is like a safer backup quarterback to have. Obviously, his this last season, he was pretty abysmal. Um, but, you know, hopefully not needing to start and I guess having that pressure kind of lets him play a little bit more loosely. And then, I mean, this is the talent that you have. Um, I think is very quarterback friendly as well um which you know is good for him 
But I, I am a fan of the Tredavious White signing. I see why you think it's kind of risky, but I think just with the loss of Aaron Donald, it's a nice way to try to compensate just getting a guy with potential, like with a top 10 cornerback upside just on your defense now, um, which I think they've more or less been lacking uh, for the past couple seasons. And so um, I'm, I'm a fan of that. But then I did really like what you said about just the development the internal development of players. Um, I think last year's draft class was phenomenal for them. Uh, looking back, it's probably one of the better classes of, you know, last season, which is really nice. Yeah, no, a hundred percent. Yeah. There's a lot of second <clears throat> great guys to choose from when we, when we get to that portion of it for the draft itself. I, I also thought this draft class is really good. Um, Jared Burris mm-hmm. is one of my favorite, like drop, draft my guys. Um, mentioned and you get him at the 19th pick that was huge for them just to get like more pass rush so like pairing him with kobe turner um and byron young is going to be really huge there, there's a good young defensive line brewing it kind of sucks that aaron donald retired at the time <laughs> mm-hmm. i would have loved to see him with with these young guys around him um and then you go back to the florida state well get his teammate frisky um good signing there i actually think Quorum is going to be more relevant than people think. Mm-hmm. I think it's going to be one of those situations where you have Kevin Williams. He had an awesome season last year, and I was pretty down on him because I thought um, uh, Zach Evans was a breakout to look at. Um, and it still could happen. Um, Sean McVay is kind of weird. Like, he's like Shannon. He's kind of weird with his running back, so you don't really know, like, how to properly parse out the fact. You'd think – Certain guys should be starting based on ability, but if you're not making mistakes, but your your talent is like not as good as the other guy, you're probably going to get more starts because you're going to let make less mistakes, like operating just a play. So there's that side of it. But I think with Corum, he's in a he grew up in a pro ready program. He kind of carried Michigan's offense from the running game perspective. Had a lot of talent to running backs, but he stood out a lot. And he he scored a lot of touchdowns last season as well for Michigan. So I'm looking at him pairing with Ky- Kyron Williams. I think it's one of those situations where, like, there's no true bell cow back. But it's also not going to be, like, a split in terms of carry. It's just going to be, like, a one week it's Kyron Williams. One week it's going to be Blake Corum. And you're not going to be able to predict. So, like, having these guys in best ball is probably a better scenario for this backfield. I don't think it's going to be a play quorum's a nice handcuff. I think it's going to be a lot more than that. Um, and if by chance Kyle Williams gets hurt, you land yourself an RB one. Mm-hmm. But I think he can still give you some value from week to week as a as a guy in this offense. Yeah, yeah. Like I wouldn't be super surprised from this backfield to see a close to maybe like a sixty five thirty five split. Um, <clears throat> just because I feel like. Blake Corum offers a different skill set than what you get with Kyron Williams. Kyron Williams really excels out of like receiving out of the backfield. And that's why he was able to excel so well last season. And uh, I think he improved greatly as a runner this last season as well. Um, he's the year prior. I know in his limited play time, there, he'd have a lot of up and down, ups and downs about two years ago. And so that's why everybody I think was really down on Kyron Williams, including myself, but uh, seeing the jump and play that he was able to make last season, um, obviously proved like pretty much everybody wrong who, cause I think most people weren't super, super high on him, especially with like a slow 40 and late dr- late round pick. But, um, yeah, overall, I think they have a lot of positives going in, going in the direction. Um, Jared verse, I think was a huge seal for him in a less offense, ha- uh, heavy draft. I, you know, I think he's probably goes in the top 10. Uh, I think we mocked him or one of, the, you know, he was one of the guys I think we mocked him or Dallas Turner uh, to the Falcons in that top right. 10. Yeah. Um, and so the fact that, you know, they're getting him at 19, uh, you know, like a mid to late first round pick was a huge steal for them with a guy that can pretty much be an instant impact pass rusher uh, for a team that lost one of the best, like probably the best uh, defensive line mm-hmm. slash kind of just pass rush player uh, in NFL history. Yeah, 100%. 100%. And it's going to be look different. We're not saying he's going to mimic Aaron Donald's production. We're not mm-hmm. saying that at all. Um, 
I think there's, I think it was just encompasses how much of a need this was. Um, going back to Kevin Williams, Blake Corum, I think, I really don't think it's going to be like the, I think the efficiency is going to be so different. Like, obviously, efficiency is something you can't predict, but I think it's just going to be like very hot hand week to week. And it's just going to be a frustrating situation to monitor. Like, it's one of those things where I'm like, I'd rather have Joe Mixon on the Texans because I know what I'm getting. Mm-hmm. I know what I'm getting out of him. I don't know what I'm getting from Los Angeles as far as like production, like next season. I know Blake Corn's a really good talent. It's great for the Rams offense to have two guys like this that they can turn to at different times. But from a fantasy perspective, it's gonna be it's gonna be a nightmare to parse out in my opinion. So it's a good it's a good problem to have for the team. Great, great problem to have for the team. I think a lot of these other guys, um, good good bench step uh, from the guards perspective, as well as like guys like Ben and Jackson, Tyler Davis, like they they amass a lot of late round picks. Um, got a guy from Stanford and with one of their late six round picks. Nice job not taking special teams so early, Los Angeles. I wonder who did that. <laughs> Unlike what Los Angeles did. Couldn't be the Bears. Um, but mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah. Um before we go into the coaching staffs, who's your second year breakout player? I know there's a lot of great <clears throat> options here. Um I'd say Kobe Turner will be mine. He ended the year, I think, with about nine sacks, which uh, was really good, you know. <clears throat> him, both him and uh, Byron Young had really good sack numbers. Um, but obviously, Kobe Turner being an interior defensive line definitely benefited the most from Aaron Donald's presence. And so, um, but I don't necessarily expect a nine sack year. Just him looking better and maybe just like upping the amount of pressures at least. I think it'd be a huge win for him and the team. Yeah. Um... And you kind of mentioned him already, but I'm going to go with Byron Young for a lot of the same reasons. Mm -hmm. I think overall, there's going to be a lot of opportunity on this defensive line. And on top of that, they already had eight or nine sacks. So it's like mostly like, oh, how much of gravitational pull did Aaron Donald have last season? And Mm -hmm. then um, without him, how much can they still produce? I think the combination of the two and then the additions they made with like first and then um, the other guy I'm forgetting about, oh, Frisky. Like, I think the combinations they've made over the past few seasons, I think it's going to help to mitigate that. They're going to have a young pass rush where it's like, you don't have this dominant guy, but you kind of have like these four rushers acting as one. Um, so week to week, it will kind of vary, but I think both these players should see upticks in production um, mm-hmm. just because of more opportunity out there for them. So it's exciting for the Rams defense. Um, my X factor this year for the Rams, I would say it's got to be, it's got to be Tredavious. It's got to be Tredavious. I think if he's like 80% of himself, the Rams got a steal, and suddenly that defense is downright terrified because they got really disciplined guys everywhere else in a young pass rush with youth that I think it really falls in the secondary. And obviously they got Cam Curl, who mm-hmm. I really like, and Darius Williams, who I've been a fan of as a steady corner. But, like, I think for an upside, if you're able to shut down a primary receiver, like what Jadavis White's capable of doing, mm-hmm. I think I think the Rams, there, there's there's some potential they can achieve with double-digit wins this year. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> um, For me, I think my X factor would be Cooper Cup. Um, <clears throat> you know, there's very much the expectation of him being Wide receiver one, obviously Puka Nakua coming in and balling out the way he did was fantastic for the team. But I think, you know, he's like, what, two? He's about to enter his third season away from his, you know, superstar year. Um, The last two years, I know he's been kind of like some derailments with injury. But, you know, he needs for this offense to just be one of the best in the league. He needs to stay healthy and he needs to. Maybe not produced to that 1,900 yard level, but um, you know he needs to get back into that like thousand yard receiver range, and um, I think that'll be able to at least compensate decent enough for the departure of Aaron Donald in terms of like matching points uh, between competing offenses that they'll face. Because I think that'll be a big issue. Like 
looking at the Packers, where they're kind of an offense. They're just looking like they're going to be an offensive juggernaut with all many receivers they're juggling. They got Josh Jacobs, you know, and just looking at the division, all their offenses look uh, pretty scary with talent. And so just having your own offense, being able to keep up with pretty much everybody else, I think is a must for this team to have success this year. Yeah, I agree with you on the injury point. I think <clears throat> because I'm noticing this in fantasy drafts as well. I think too many people are down on Cooper Cup this year, mm-hmm. and I don't understand it. I think I don't think Puka is the clear number one here. Mm-hmm. I think it's one of those situations where it's going to be like a Chris Godwin, Mike Evans, like Christian Kirk, like Calvin Ridley type situation mm-hmm. because. I I just have this feeling Cooper Cup's gonna have that one like ten catch, two hundred <laughs> yard, two touchdown game, mm-hmm. and everybody's like, "How did Cooper Cup go in like the fourth round of drafts? How do we how do we forget that Cooper Cup was good because of the of the Puka wave that's happened last year?" And I I don't know. I guess it's seeing Puka Nakua at wide receiver seven and like Cooper Cup like later than that. But I'm just I just have this feeling where it's where Puka and Cooper are gonna have the similar stats, mm-hmm. but you're not gonna know how they're gonna get there. Mm-hmm. And I would just say just draft both. Dra- dra- draft like like either or and it don't don't blink because you're gonna get similar production, I think. If anything, I would I'd be drafting more Cooper Cup than Puka because mm-hmm. you're prob you're probably gonna get him later, which allows you to get a really good back. Like a Saquon Barkley, Josh Jacobs, <laughs> and then pair that with the Cooper Cup, where it's like the Puka, you run the risk of like not getting a good running back and like having to build your draft around somewhere. Like I'm not at, I'm not trying to act like those are your only options. There's a lot of great receivers out there um in the early rounds, but with the Rams situation in particular, I I don't think Cooper Cup's falling off the face of the earth. I also don't think he's gonna have a nineteen hundred yard season just because of the your talent on the roster, mm-hmm. but I wouldn't give up on. I think I I'm more confident that he's going to be a a great X factor for this team if he is the X factor. I'm more confident that he's going to hold up to his billing than maybe somebody like Jadavis White staying healthy. I guess, mm-hmm. but um, it is it is another thing where Cooper Cup has to stay healthy. That is important. Mm-hmm. That is very important you know, criteria there. Yeah. Okay. Seattle. Um, this is a fun team. This is probably like I mean, I'm I'm gonna lie. I think Arizona is also a fun team when we get to them. <laughs> but for me, when I look at their schedule, they they actually also have double digit win capability as well. And it depends how quickly the team catches up to Mike McDonald's scheme. So I'm gonna say their their floor to ceiling is gonna be seven to ten wins. But I actually like their schedule a lot more than the Rams. And it's I think it's partially because like the Rams got dealt with like the Eagles draw being second in division and the Eagles finishing second for some reason. Um, but I'm gonna say that's my four the ceiling for Seattle. Expects uh, seven to ten wins there. Yeah. Um I'll mine probably pretty close to that too. Like you said, their schedule's a lot more favorable compared to the Rams. Um, I think there's a lot more winnable games. Um, so I think I have them maybe like a 9 to 12 as well. Um, <clears throat> I think it's going to be really close. It just depends on if, I guess, Gino has a bounce back season. Because I know last year he was, in, like two years ago, he, he balled out like none other, I think. Um, but last season he wasn't as balling out as I guess he a lot of people expected him to be. And so if he can get back to that level again, I think I'm confident in them winning a lot of these 50-50 games. Um, but if not, then I can see your prediction being like your floor uh, being a more realistic scenario for them. Yeah, 100%. I wasn't really a fan of their free agency picks other than the re-signings. I didn't think there was a guy that, necessarily stood out to me besides maybe Jenkins. And I know they went with another um they got Burns like a corner and they got another um safety in Kevon Wallace. But like it wasn't really like wow like splash signing but I actually really like it. So there were 
like it was okay, I'd say. Um, and I think maybe it's because it, since they lost like Wagner and Brooks, it's kind of like, oh, how how do you how do you get good linebacker play now? And I'm a little skeptical on that side of their moves, but um, other than that, like I think it's. I think it was important for them to like resign the guys that they did. Have. <clears throat> mm-hmm. so. Yeah, for their free agency moves, um, I was actually a pretty big fan of Jerome Baker. He was kind of one of the uh, cap casualty cuts. I think the Dolphins ended up making last or during the course of this off season, where uh, <clears throat> I think a lot of players we were surprised left were not, you know, were no longer with that Dolphins team, and so um, I think. From a player to player, like direct comparison, I do think he'll have a better year than Bobby Wagner this season. Um, and so that is one signing I like. And then um, I'm glad that they did some investing into the offensive line. Um, because obviously, you know, you need decent offensive linemen. Maybe that was part of the issue last season. I wasn't following him super tightly, but, um, you know, with just how the offensive line looks going into this season, that may have been a concern and an issue last season in terms of Geno Smith's production. And so um, that is, those are some other moves that I'm okay with, I guess. I mean, they're not super flashy offensive linemen. I do like the Nick Harris signing though. I think Mm -hmm. that was really good. Yeah. And so I think from a, yeah, free agent signing uh, perspective, nothing overly flashy, I think is what, Maybe most people might be down on, but I think they have a couple like uh, Jerome Baker. I'm a fan of the offensive line. Jonathan Hankins, I think, is all right. You know, it's a backup nose tackle. Um, obviously, he's well out of his prime at this stage in his career, but he's still serviceable there. But yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, going into their draft picks, <laughs> I think um, Byron Murphy was a very key keep it for them considering like how well Matabuke did and um Mike McDonald's scheme. Mm. He he's a guy they're gonna build around and I personally think is a very great defensive tackle. So um he's definitely gonna help out against the run. Much needed move. Christian Haynes was a guy we had talked about as like a guard um that we really liked as well. Um and other than that it's just like who are these guys? But like okay. Um, yeah, I guess I never heard of like AJ Barner, like Ty- Tyrese Knight. Um, these are guys I haven't watched for since I didn't know what to make of them, but in the first two picks, I, I think is really good. I think an important one to know, um, about is Michael Javel. He's a tackle out of Finley. Um, he he ran a he ran a sub 540, he's 6'5 and 310 pounds. He also had a 32-inch vertical jump and 26 bench presses. So, I mean, for a swing tackle pound allocation, like I think that's those are really good traits to have for a six-round pick, and uh, that's kind of exciting to have, like as a future for your tackle base for that offensive line investment you mentioned. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <clears throat> and so it's like, in my opinion, too. I think this is a situation where. <clears throat> they got like kind of a lot of high potential, kind of low floor kind of players, especially with this offensive line where, you know, let's say Geno Smith takes a big regression step this year. Um, they're kind of in a position where they can do like a little bit of a rebuild with uh, just getting things set up for the future, which I think is nice for them. I think, I mean, most of the team is pretty young. Tyler Lockett's a bit older, but, uh, it seems like the steps are in place for them. If they need to draft a quarterback high next season, uh, it's kind of they're they're fitting the mold, I think, pretty well there. But yeah, and they're also taking their chance on um, well, what's the guy's name out of Washington? Uh, Sam Howell. Yeah. So like, they have like multiple strategies in place, which is which is good. Good organizations do this, so mm-hmm. um, I like that standpoint for them. But I think Byron Murphy is gonna. That was definitely a great pickup for. Mm-hmm. what this defense needs. Um, second year breakout for me, I think you have to put JSN here. Uh-huh. Like, there, there's there's some good odds. Like, Devon, you could say Devon, but, but I think with JSN, like, being the one thing that scares me about Waldron's offense for the Bears is how underutilized JSN was. I think he's actually going to be unlocked this season. I'm, I would keep tabs on him 
in fantasy, see like, oh, when does he become a value? Because I think there's some cases where he's gonna he's gonna put up a lot of wide receiver two two numbers where it's either you're gonna be frustrated by Lockett or DK mm-hmm. during some weeks because JSN is eating. And I yeah. think he'll get a lot more opportunities. <clears throat> I think Mike McDonald had a quote where he's like, uh, JSN will be a big part of what they do on offense. Like mm-hmm. just flat out general. And that's gonna that means run involvement, pass involvement. Like that's that's coming that's coming a that's coming a long way in my pick. So um he's my pick. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> yeah. Um I agree with that. I feel like Jay, I mean Jay said he was drafted, he was the first wide receiver drafted in this class. Um, and I think going into that draft, everybody was pretty excited about Jason and wondering where he was going to go. I think a lot of people are pretty disappointed with the fact that, you know, he got drafted to be behind Metcalf and Lockett. Um, I think for fantasy purposes, rightfully so, you know, but, um, I think it was very much a built for the future type draft move where Jason doesn't need to play immediately. And the time he did play as well last season, um, I think he like statistically, I think he did. I think he supposedly did really well. I might have to go back and check exactly the statistics, but I know that a lot of fans of the Seahawks were pretty excited with uh, how JSM played with his limited role last season. And so I think, like you said, if the coaching staff says his uh, role is going to grow, um, then I'll you know I'll believe it. I think the skill is all there. Uh, there it wasn't necessarily a skill issue in regards to him not having as much play time. Yeah. I think it's one of those cases where you just got to give a guy time to develop. And I think he came in with a lot of great skills that he could play like day one, but also there's some things he needs to work on as well. Mm -hmm. I think he's at the stage where he can start to uh, be producing a lot. And Mm -hmm. um, you're going to see that this year. For me, I want to touch on that same coaching staff you referenced because it is a good mix. While you delve into it, there's a lot of like first time, like, head coaches and coordinators here. So, like, um, you got Mike McDonald, one of my favorite coaching hires situations. I think he's going to keep it very competitive. I'm excited to see how he he handles, um, like, going to get um, – no, they don't have the ASC West on their schedule. That's unfortunate. But I'm really excited to see how he handles Kyle Shanahan's schemes. I think that will be fun. And Sean McVay's schemes twice a year. Um, with the, with his defense, I think that's going to be matchup viewing. Um, he's a great defensive mind. He does a great job of like bringing the same pressures, but like different guys, but also mixing up different alignments. So everything somehow looks the same between different alignments, but like you don't know which seven guys are coming on the same blitz concept. It's a very unique style on how you, you can't really prepare for it. Um, like it's. You need a veteran offensive line group that has been like a eagle, like Eagles before Kelsey retired, to be able to handle this kind of stuff mm-hmm. that he runs. So, um, I have no doubt he's going to do his billing on the defensive end. The one guy I want to pay attention to is Ryan Grubb. Um, he had a great he had a great stop at Washington with like three pro ready receivers with McMillan, uh, with Adunze and um, Polk, and then Penix as well, and like. A lot, a lot of great talent. Then. So he's proven he can do some things with good talent. Now I want to see what he does in the pro NFL. That might be the biggest wild card for me. But I'm not too worried about that inexperience because um, at assistant head coach, they have Leslie Frazier. This will be his 25th year in the NFL. Um, a lot of experience. Um, I thought he was done dirty by the Bills, personally. Um, like, granted, like... Losing the game because of 13 seconds to the Chiefs, that's tough. But, like, he's a great defensive coordinator. Mm-hmm. He, he, like, when he was coaching the Bills, a defensive coordinator, like, they were, they were, like, top one in every category. He was getting major, like, head coaching considerations. Mm-hmm. And to have him as an assistant head coach behind a great defensive mastermind, like, he's going to complement a lot of what McDonald does, but using his um, head coaching experience mm-hmm. from with the Vikings. So, um, yeah. I'm... I think this is a good head coaching situation, despite mm-hmm. the, the years of experience that are right at the top that you see. Yeah. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see kind of how the culture shifts with the team, just because, you know, Pete Carroll's been there for so long. Um, it's kind of been like a staple of the culture. Um, 
And so I, I think something new is exciting for this team, though. Um, sometimes already successful teams, it's kind of scary to see uh, big coaching staff changes like the ones that they're facing. But um, I think this is one of those cases where it can be a positive thing and kind of just uh, schematically boosts the team a little bit more. 100%. It's, I feel like I blinked and I just saw the Legion of Boom. Like it's it's been it's crazy how it's been like eleven years since that happened. Mm-hmm. Um, alrighty, last last team. I think this is a fun situation personally. Mm-hmm. Really excited to see how high the Cardinals go this season as far as one loss record. Um, <clears throat> their schedule is not the greatest, but mm-hmm. I will say they're like after their bye week, the schedule looks a lot better. A lot, yeah. lot better. So I could see this team as one of those teams that makes like a second half surge, despite not starting out the season the best. I'm gonna, I, I'm gonna say there's their ceiling, the uh, Florida ceiling is like six to ten wins. Um, and I know that's not like <clears throat> the best prognostication, like based on like my previous explanation of saying, oh, this is gonna be a fun team. I just think. They're a year away from hitting that double-digit win type season. I think they're going to surprise a lot of people. I wouldn't be surprised if they hit 10 wins this year, but I could also see them hit uh, somewhere as low as six wins. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's funny as uh, that was kind of exactly what I was thinking too, about six to 10 wins for this team. Uh, and like you said, looking at their schedule, I'd say they probably have the second toughest in the division this year, um, <clears throat> just with how brutal that first half of the season is for them. You know, they, they do finish – well, they do have a part of their second half, which I think is pretty favorable to them. You, know, you get uh, the Vikings, which I think there will be some question marks in regards to the quarterback play, the Patriots, the Panthers. Um, and then, I mean, you know, we have the question marks around the Seahawks. I think, you know, they could you look at the split. Obviously, the 49ers will be a tough game at the end of the season. But, um, <clears throat> oh, looks like I – what? But yeah, um, I do think they are an interesting team to look at and are definitely, like you said, a couple of years out of a contention, but they're definitely moving in the right direction. Yeah, and be- I, I really love the infrastructure they built. I think mm-hmm. from a free agency standpoint, um, now's the time where you take as many risks as you can. So getting guys like Jonah Williams, it didn't exactly pan out, but had a lot of promise on the Bengals. Mm-hmm. Um uh, Justin Jones, like Bilal Nichols. I looked at a lot of their defensive line times. I'm like, dang it, that would have been nice to have for the Bears. Mm-hmm. Um, Sean Murphy bunch. <clears throat> like, they're not guys that are like, whoa, but there's like, I'm a little bit more intrigued on what they did than than what Seattle did, per se. So I thought they had a better free agency than Seattle. Um, they hit the knees that they needed to. And considering um, where uh, uh, Jonathan Gannon, yeah, Jonathan Gannon um, likes to run from a scheme standpoint. Defensive line is very key for them to hit, and I think they did that. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> yeah, um, I think yeah, I think their free agency was also pretty nice. Um, I haven't looked too far into the defensive alignment that they uh, added, but you know, I I was a fan of the Jonah Williams signing, um, and I like the fact that he's kind of on a kind of like a one-year kind of short-term contract style <clears throat> situation here where I think, you know, I was talking about how during the draft process that um, I wouldn't be surprised if they still draft an offensive tackle um, just to sit behind Jonah Williams for a year and then kind of have him fit into the role. I wouldn't be surprised if, well, here it says Isaiah Adams is, uh, is playing left guard right now. Um, he, he is, or he was a tackle in college. And so, you know, there's that potential chance that, you know, Jonah Williams, they kind of move on from next year. Just, he asks for a little bit too much, and then they kick Isaiah Adams out to the offensive tackle position and then draft a true left guard. Or, you know, they try to develop another play in their left guard position there. And then I'm also a pretty big fan of Mac Wilson. Um, try to keep it quick, too, where I think I was a, I was a person that wanted the Broncos to draft him like five years ago. Um, he hasn't had necessarily the craziest of careers, but I do think that he offers – decent, you know, sideline to sideline capability uh, in terms of off-ball linebackers. And I think part of that's due to the lack of stats is due to him being a weak side linebacker where he doesn't, you know, go on the heavy sets and uh, 
in small or in higher secondary packages, you may see a bit less of him in terms of uh, just kind of the heavy set linebackers on the field. Yeah, and it and it kind of depends. They have a lot of <laughs> like granted they traded um, one of the linebackers, but they still have Zayvon Collins there. So there's a lot of like tinkering mm-hmm. around they can do. Um, guess how many draft picks the Cardinals had? A ton. Like, 12. Yeah, 12. Yeah. <laughs> it, it was kind of ridiculous. Uh, oh. I think it's um, Monty Austin Ford. That's like a key staple of his um, trading down. Um, and it started with Marvin Harrison Jr. Um, probably the best receiver in this class for me. Um, mm. One of those guys, I wanted the Bears to take a one, tag along and take a receiver before they made that trade for Keenan Allen and trading Justin Fields. Um, great way, great way to start out the draft. Um, you got your number one option for sure. And that's, that's going to fill the void of like, Oh, missing that true wide receiver one. It puts less pressure on Michael Wilson, Greg Dorch as receiving threats. They can kind of slot in into just being functional guys and they're great at their individual roles. But I think having, um, uh, have, having Marvin Harrison there is like key for them. And then you pair that with uh, Max Melton Rutgers guy, are you? Let's go. Um, <laughs> said about him. Um, but he was a guy that flashed um, from a cornerback's perspective. Very quick, very quick guy. Ran a, a sub 4 3 in the 40. I think he's, I think he can add something to the secondary. Um, I really like the Trey Benson pick. A lot of potential. Um, I think he, he could easily be the starter. And this is coming from a guy who was really high on, um, the, the Williams guy. Yeah, he, he was the backup to James Conner this year. But, um, yeah, don't, don't, it's sort of a K. Okay. Man, who's, can't think of him right now. Uh, uh, Keontae Ingram. Keontae Ingram. Mm-hmm. That was the guy. Yeah. I was really high on Keontae Ingram, but they don't have him this year. So I think, I think this. I think Benson has some higher upside than Ingram did, and that's saying a lot. Um, we'll see. We'll see what happens if he can eventually win the job, or whether he needs one year. Um, I still think he could do a lot on on third downs and uh, protective pass protection. So that's he's gonna he's gonna be a value add for Kyler Murray, who would need, who need as much protection as he can get. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, yeah. I thought yeah. This this is a fun draft class just to look at. I think. Uh, you know, there's, I think there's, they, they got a couple steel picks like Christian Jones, I think was the guy we looked at as, uh, going like maybe like late day two. Um, and then obviously Isaiah Adams was the guy that I was just talking about. He was the third round pick from him, <clears throat> but yeah, obviously Marvin Harrison, uh, is a baller. Uh, I'm, I'm excited to see how he does this season, especially just because the wide receiver one role is completely wide open for pretty much anybody to take. And he's going as like wide receiver nine in fantasy drafts. It's ridiculous. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm more I'm mostly positive about him. You know, um, I think statistic from a the statistics behind it don't really matter too much. But I know it's like <clears throat> wide receivers taken like top fives. Like hit rate was like somewhat low. But um, I mean, I think Marvin Harrison Jr. balled out in college. I think. Uh, He'll continue to ball out here. I think <clears throat> that while he is an unbelievable talent, um, I still think the Cardinals need another guy to step up or at least maybe another year out to draft somebody that can play a solid wide receiver two role to Marvin Harrison. Um, just because if you know your eggs are all in the Marvin Harrison basket to elevate your offense to the very next level to, you know, make yourself playoff contenders. I don't, I don't think so. I really don't think so <clears> because <throat> one of my X factors on the team is actually <clears throat> Trey McBride. Um, mm-hmm. He technically broke out already last season. Um, but I think with the presence of him mm-hmm. with Marvin Harrison Jr., I think they have their two guys. Mm-hmm. I don't <clears throat> think you have to worry too much about those two. Maybe it's, maybe Dorch takes a step up. Maybe mm-hmm. Michael Wilson takes a step up. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not really counting on it, but from like a receiving standpoint, I actually think they're okay so mm-hmm. far. Um, <clears throat> yeah, luxury picks, luxury picks. It's it's great to have like a, a another 
number one level wide receiver. Um, so mm-hmm. you have two on the team. But I think the way they're structured right now, I think they'll be okay. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> yeah, so I would just think that, like, another year out, I wouldn't be surprised if they take maybe, a, like, a second-round wide receiver just to kind of balance things out. Um, because, like, I'm a fan of Michael Wilson. Um, I do think he is probably the second-best receiver. But um, last season, I know Kyler Murray – just on average targeted Greg Dortch more, who I don't think is as a great receiving uh, talent compared to the rest of the room. I'd like to say Jones. I think he'll probably round up and be the wide receiver too on this team. Um, so I think that's serviceable for now, but um, I mean, yeah, I guess, yeah, I agree with like Trey McBride, Marvin Harrison's going to be like the key duo here, but again, both are just young and inexperienced. And so that's just kind of the one thing that would hold them back. But yeah. I still think that, um, I mean, they'll both probably ball out, but it just, yeah. Uh, and then it's one of those landing spots. If you have like a Michael Thomas, and you're just like, oh, what the heck? Are we, like, was the worst that can happen? Like, mm-hmm. this is the one of the landing spots that makes sense for a guy like Michael Thomas to come in. Not mm-hmm. really having high expectations, but his upside is like significant enough where like you can't key in on a Trey McBride or Marvin Harrison uh-huh. too much because you got a slant, slant guy mm-hmm. over there just killing it and I'm not saying this because Michael Thomas only runs slants. He does a lot more than that. Great boundary receiver. Like he can do it all. Okay. Um, but I mean, this, this is one of those cases where, yeah, they are a young team and they need, they need that better in leadership. I do agree. I think they're missing that. Um, I think as for the Dorch production, I think it's more of a fast that like how the merge is like targeting slot receivers a lot more frequently. Mm-hmm. Um, he has shown, like, with a DeAndre Hopkins, he'll hyper-target him, for sure. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. But I think his preference from, like, just an overall playing style is a very quick thrower and decision-maker. So, like, that works. But it bodes well for stock receivers because they need less time to get open, um, ju- just relative to their positioning on the field, <laughs> as opposed to outside receivers trying to make their way across the field and whatnot. Um, so... That that kind of explains it because of the time to throw, but um, they're they're both like solid, like better than solid receivers in my mind. So I'm not I'm not a hard I'm not too worried basically. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Who is your X factor while we're at it? <clears throat> um, X factor. I feel like just Kyler Murray. I think a lot of people are down on him. Uh, it's kind of up to him to show it if he's got it still or not. So I'm just gonna have him as kind of a generic X factor, but. Yeah. Okay. Do you want to put in your second year breakout while you're at it? Uh, second year breakout. I'll have like BJ Ojolari. Um, <clears throat> I was pretty high on him in the draft. Um, he only had four sacks last season. I don't necessarily know the amount of pressures he had, but um, obviously his. I think his brother's good, and so like I'm hoping, you know, both the brothers have good careers, and <clears throat> um, just kind of seeing him have a step up, especially just the fact that there is a lot of talent on this defensive line that, you know, doesn't necessarily mean or have a great scenarios where a lot of teams are doubling him. Um, I, I think he'd be a nice guy just to boost this defense a little bit more. I'm going to say my second year breakout is Paris Johnson. I think he's going to get tested a lot with uh, great pass rushers in the NFC <clears throat> West, um, but high draft value guy. He has a lot. He has a lot going for him. He has a lot of great traits. I think it's going to realize itself with more talent on the team, how great of a pass protector he is. Because if you think about Kyler Murray, he wants to scramble out the pocket as soon as possible. Like Probably one of the things he could get better at is decision-making within the pocket and not leaving so early. I think better pass protection from Paris Johnson is going to help realize that. And mm-hmm. I think he's due for a great season for an offensive lineman, which is limited amount of sacks, definitely a lot of pancakes. Um, so really, really excited to see how he does this season. I think he's going to have a great year. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, from a coaching standpoint, this is another unit um, where they have younger coaching staffs per se. Um, obviously, with Jonathan Gannon, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of excitement around him. I'm try- I was on the wrong tab when I'm pulling up these coaches, so I'm. It's going to take me a minute to get that. But Drew Pensing. Um, a lot of great reviews about him. Don't really know too much about Nick Rallis. So I'm really excited to see how he does. I don't think he'll have the full say in like what the play calls are because obviously got Gannon there. But mm-hmm. um, 
very young coaching staff here. Um, I think we'll need to see this year how they do um, as far as the team, like based on the additions they made, because Monty's doing his job, like implementing a lot of like young talent guys, great football guys. So I I think this year is more of like an assessment. I'm like, oh, what does the coaching staff do with better talent? Mm -hmm. They play hard. They play hard for Jonathan Gannon, 100%. They put themselves in a lot of games they shouldn't have been in. Given the state of the roster, um, so I didn't. I, I have a feeling that's going to continue. It reminds me a lot about like a Eberflus situation with the, with the Bears. Like mm-hmm. they were constantly getting mocked because their win loss record was horrible. But if you watch the games closely, they they compete every time. They just been losing at the margins. I would expect the same thing for the Cardinals. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I think yeah. It's, uh, it's, it'll be kind of fun just to see just like a bunch of new, I think this, this division in general has a lot of fun coaching uh, competition. I mean, Sean McVay, Kyle Shanahan are kind of like the OGs now of the, uh, of the division, which is kind of funny with how, just considering how young they are just in general. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I, I don't have too much to add on about the uh, coaching staff for the Cardinals here, but um, yeah, hopefully, you know, things go in the right direction for them. Yeah. And with that, guys, that wraps up our summer division series. All eight divisions, all 32 teams um, tried to fit it in with 15-minute segments. Sometimes we went over. Sometimes we went less. Of course, I want to end this episode as soon as possible. So you can get out of here. <laughs> I'll, I'll do them a solid there. Thank you guys for tuning in all series long. Um, once we get organized on the YouTube channel, uh, I'm on a mission. You'll definitely see each team breakdown, what we thought for their season outlook. And Coach Town's playing the piano under our Instagram handle, adamon.a.mission over here. Um, give it a follow. Um, give it a like on our posts that we haven't updated in a year. But, <laughs> yes. yeah, do that. Do what uh-huh. he did. Okay. And, uh, yeah, uh, we might not meet next week, so we will see you in two weeks. We'll be happy to cover um, our thoughts going into the season. Um, we, don't, we don't have a set topics right away, but it mm-hmm. should be exciting. You guys should tune in. And with that, have a good night, guys. Yeah. Peace.